roofing industry isn't designed for snowflakes. You gotta be tough. Don't just eat it, use it as a marketing budget. They think they're a claims expert. expert. They think they're a roofing expert, right? You take the good with the bad and you stay away from the ugly. LC, you probably one of the most controversial men in the roofing industry. Uh, in the beginning, I would like to get a commitment from you and from my audience that no matter on disagreements we might have, because I know I've seen your content before and 2020 is crazy year. It's election year, our nation divided like never before. You know, everybody has opinion on masks, who we're gonna vote for, riots, black lives matter. I mean, the nation keeps dividing, dividing, but the roofing industry also is divided. You have storm chasers, you have roofing contractors. So I know you're controversial. I'm just asking my audience, guys, let's treat each other with respect. I wanna respect myself, what I do. You, you've done amazing for yourself. You build amazing businesses. Can I get a commitment that we're gonna respect each other and you guys in comments below are gonna respect uh, my guest here and myself, no matter what the topic is, uh, no matter what you're gonna comment, if you disagree about conversation or opinion, please have respect in mind. With that said, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for agreeing for this interview. We're in your beautiful house in Colorado. Uh, let's start with your uh, name, LC. I've never uh, met anyone with that name, just two letters. Yeah. What's the story of your name? Um, so it stands for Little Chris. My real name is Chris. Okay. And LC uh, was given to me as a nickname back in high school. And uh, I went to work for a roofing company out in Virginia that had several Chris's that worked in the office. And so that were salespeople. And so I thought, well, I'll never get my leads if my name's Chris. So, so I'll just go by my high school nickname, LC, and it stuck. And so most people don't even know my real I didn't full know. name. I thought your name is LC. That's why I asked. I'm glad I asked. Yeah. Wow. So your name is Little Chris. And the reason you call yourself LC because you wanted to get leads. Wow. Talking about importance of name. To get leads, sometimes you have to change it. Did it work out? Yeah, you know, I think everybody in the industry knows me as LC. I know when my wife calls me LC, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how does she call you usually? Chris? Chris, Chris. yeah. LC, wow. Well, LC, I see, love it. Um, let's start with your job history. You mentioned you started working for a roofing uh, company. When yeah. was that, so 25, 30 years ago? When I was in high school, my uncle was a manufacturer's rep. And he, he he was in the supply chain business, and uh, you know I was looking for a summer job, so he got me one as a laborer on a roofing crew, and I realized very quickly that's not what I wanted to do when I grew up, and so I moved over to distribution, working for a supply house, delivering material to roofing contractors, and I did that throughout high school and college. And uh, after college, I decided throwing 100 pound bundles of shingles was probably not the future I wanted to have. So there was a, I grew up in Kansas City and uh, there was a hailstorm in Maryville, Missouri and northwest side of the state. And I went in and I asked my boss one day, I said, hey, what's the difference between these two types of contractors that come in and buy material from us? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you have one contractor who's driving a nice truck. He's always got a smile on his face and he never has to see the credit guy. But then the other guy who's driving a shoddy truck looks miserable. And every time he comes in, he has to go see the credit guy. What's the difference? And he said, well, that's easy. You know, the guy that's unhappy, he does retail work. And the guy who's happy does storm work. And so I said, well, there was a storm in Maryville, Missouri, and I, one of the roofers we serviced just offered me a job. And, uh, you know, I think I'd like to go try my hand at sales. And so I did. And I was very unsuccessful for a couple of years. It was unsuccessful. Very, yeah. It was, uh, you know, door knocking. You know, I had a very difficult time getting people to allow me to inspect a roof. I also didn't know how to measure a roof. I didn't know how to install one and I didn't know how to sell one. 
So I struggled through my first couple of years working for about a half a dozen different roofing companies. So they were not training you? Was not? Yeah, that was the thing. They were all missing something, right? <clears throat> you know, today with the internet, Google, right? There's a lot of information available on whatever topic you want to research. But back in the 90s, there wasn't this information available. And so who do you turn to to create your career path and what that might look like? And where's the foundation of education going to come from? And so, uh, you know, I learned a little bit about the material side, running around with my uncle, working at the supply house. But uh, like I mentioned, I did, didn't know how to install one. So I became uh, the first American contractor to go to Canada to learn how to roof. So growing up in Kansas City, Cedar Shakes and Shingles um, were all over the metro area. And so I, I learned, I wanted, I wanted to learn the wood shake and shingle market. And so uh, the Cedar Shake and Shingle Bureau connected me with the Roofing Contractors Association of British Columbia. And I went up there and learned how to roof. What did they have, like a school, like installation school? Installation school, quality auditing school. I mean, we actually went to the mills where they cut down the, for uh, the trees in the forest, put them in the river, take them out of the river, cut them up, you know, guys missing fingers, grading that material, and then quality auditing that material. How did it help you? How did that experience help you? Were you, at that time, were you still in sales? Are you already? So I was in sales still... and I was struggling and I knew that I- why, did, why sales guy would go and learn how to install? Well, I think that's the biggest problem with a lot of roofers today is they've never installed a roof. They're simply a marketing company that provides an outsourced service uh, for labor. But if you don't- Do, do you see a problem with that? Yeah, there's definitely a problem with that. And, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I knew early on, if I don't understand how to speak to each specific roof, you know, Honda makes a Honda Accord. It's the same worldwide, right? And so when, when you know, you look at a roof, every roof is special, right? And it, depending on when it was built, where it was built, whether it's up to code, the manufacturers produce tons of literature and information if you're willing to go seek it out, right? And, and you know, my uncle being a manufacturer's rep, he had a ton of information available, but really what I needed was kind of, kind of compartmentalize the sales, the measuring, the installation, and uh, the material, right? And so putting all, all that together, I, I, I began my journey of educating myself over the next couple of years. Did it help you to sell jobs? Yeah, so I'll tell you. So I went to the RCABC school to learn how to put a roof on, how to, um, you know, quality audit the material that we were installing. And that was extreme, probably one of the most beneficial pieces of my whole career. How long did it take you? How long was it? I, I think I was there a month and you know, being one the, month is a lot for a training. Yeah. They were awfully surprised that an American wanted to come to Canada to learn how to roof. But, uh, I took the recommendation of the Cedar, uh, shake and shingle bureau and they sponsored my trip. Wow. And, uh, and so they put me up and taught me how to roof. And when I got done there, I went to Hague engineering school for damage assessment from wind and hail. And, uh, you know, did, did that help you? You know, it did. It did. What I, what I learned, um, was, um, well, first of all, I was the only contractor at the seminar. The, the, the whole the building adjuster. was full of adjusters. Now you go at 50, 50. But... And so really what I learned was how to get a roof bought. Right. And, I took that education and then went and found a couple of guys that I respected in Kansas City uh, to teach me geometry, how to measure a roof, right? Here I am two years in the business and I still don't know how to measure a roof, right? It, it was pretty frustrating. <laughs> and so once I learned how to measure a roof, right, then I found another guy who taught me how to sell. And that's a pretty interesting story. Um, we all have them. 
you know, as we learn. But uh, it was a friend of mine in Kansas City, and he said, hop in my truck, and I'm going to teach you how to sell on one condition. I said, sure. He said, you got to do whatever I tell you to do whenever I tell you to do it. I said, okay. And he was a Golden Gloves boxer and big, tough guy. And I was like, oh, I better listen to what he has to say. So we went driving around. And, you know, Kansas City is not that big of a town. If you go an hour in any direction, you're going to be in a cornfield. And so we ended up driving through farmland. And, you know, he's just telling me about, you know, uh, sales is about the transfer of belief from one person to the other. And who wants it more than the other guy? Because every conversation, every meeting, every marriage, every business, somebody buys something and somebody sells something in every interaction. And so I'm getting all That's pumped good, up. Good and, yeah, I'm getting all pumped up and I'm, and I'm thinking I can apply this, you know. And I'll, all I thought is he was driving around and just kind of walking me through verbally on how this gets done. Well, we're driving through a cornfield, I mean, farmland, and uh, we pull up to a farmhouse. And he says, you see that old man over there mowing his grass? I said, yeah. He said, go sign him up. I said, sign him up for what? <laughs> he said, a new roof. I said, well, what makes you think he has any damage on that roof? He said, I didn't ask you if there was damage on the roof. I told you to go sign him up. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I don't want to get out of this truck. I don't want to go talk to that old man and listen to this guy. He's crazy. How did you find him? Uh, so I found him in Lawrence, Kansas. There was a hailstorm there. And he, uh, I went and drove through the storm about four days after the was storm. Was he good? Like, he had 200 signs in a, in a subdivision. They were all his. That's why you went with him. Yeah, I said, well, clearly this guy knows what he's doing. And so... Uh, Wally's his name. Uh, Wally said, you know, you got to get out of the truck and go sign him up. And I said, well, I don't want to. And he got violently loud with me and said, get out of my truck and uh, or you're walking home. No, actually, what he said was get out of my truck. And if you don't sign him up, you're walking home. That's a motivation. I'm terrified, right? So I get out of the truck, I walk around and uh, I go up to this old man. And I'm like, uh, can I inspect your roof for hell damage? And he's like, what? <laughs> and, and I'm like, yeah, I'll, it'll just take 10 or 15 minutes. I'll get up, take some Polaroid pictures, come down, show you what I found, <laughs> and uh, let you know if you have an insurance claim. And the guys must have told me no a hundred times. Finally, he said yes. I think I just wore him out. And, but I was more afraid of the guy over there in the truck <laughs> And I was this old farmer mowing his grass. So uh, I get up on the roof. And I, all I can think about is when I get down, this guy's not going to sign a contract with me. And that crazy guy's going to leave me. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. How am I going to get home? <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, I must have spent an hour inspecting a 20 square roof, right? <laughs> and and uh, I, got, I got off the ladder. I came down. And I asked him to sign my contract. It felt like a hundred times again. He kept telling me no. Finally, he took the pen out of my hand, took my clipboard, signed my contract. And as soon as he was done signing his name, I hear the truck door close. And I look over and this big guy, Wally's sprinting over to me and he says, hey, hey, you know, grabs the clipboard from the old man throws it on the ground with the contract in his hand, he rips it in half. And he said, old man, you don't have any storm damage. Young man, now you know how to sell. Wow. Did he have uh, st uh, storm damage? No, no, he didn't have any storm. He had damage up there, but I didn't know what it was from. I don't even remember doing a test square or looking for damage. I was just terrified to get off the roof and ask him to sign up with okay. me. So what happened next? Did you learn how to sell? Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I learned my installation knowledge. I learned damage assessment. I learned how to measure and I learned how to ask for the business. And I took all of that out here. I think it was August 11th of 1997. There was a big hailstorm here in Denver. And, um, 
I called the guy who taught me how to measure and I said, hey, uh, there's a big hailstorm in Denver. I'm going. You want to come with me? And he said, well, you know, LC, I own my own business here locally in Kansas City. Why would I go out there? I said, well, I'm on my way to your house. We're leaving right now. And I get to his house and his wife's like, you're going where to do what? <laughs> anyway, we ended up getting in the truck, driving out here to Denver, and we pulled into a 7-Eleven. And I went inside, got a phone book, and ripped out the roofer section and went and started calling through roofing contractors that I could come sell for, or we could come sell for. And uh, our deal was, Daryl, you're going to measure the roofs, and I'm going to sell them. Okay, seemed like a good partnership, right? We certainly didn't have Eagle View back in those days. And so we ended up selling 186 roofs in six, six weeks, door to door. And uh, it was then that I realized, wow, you know, I, I hadn't sold 50 roofs in my first two years. Now I just sold a, over 150 in six weeks. You know, I've made it. How, how are you compensating for those roofs? How did you come up with the uh, pay structure? Mm. How are you selling to the company? I was a salesman. They paid me 10% of the contract. But the problem is they didn't pay me. No, we did all this work, started building the jobs, and uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, by this time, it was probably November, and because it was snowing that day. It was a Saturday morning. We all got called in for an emergency sales meeting, and the company had 40 salesmen. Oh. Yeah, and um, we were all wait waiting outside the gate, and the gentleman the owner, one of the owners came out and said, me and my three partners are splitting up and any of you salesmen that think we owe you money, we'll see you in court. And that was my last day there. The uh, funny thing was that the guy had the audacity to ask me to stay uh, with him to start a new business. I said, enough's enough and I moved on. So here, here, you know. Did you get paid any money or? Yeah, we got paid some along the way. But probably two thirds of the money we expected to be paid was not paid. So the whole experience was was a oh, failed cool. experience. Yeah. You pay for education. Yes, you certainly have to do that in the roofing industry. You know, those of us that have been around a while know what scar tissue feels like. There's plenty of it, and so uh, you know, you got to be willing to fight to survive in the roofing business. Uh, nothing comes easy, and you know, you've, you've got to be able to take the educational experience into your own hands and own it. So moving fast forward, you build since then several over $100 million companies. Tell me how that all came about and, and the biggest one, or not the biggest one, but you were the most recent one. What happened? To, why did you get out of roofing business? If, if you were so successful, you built $100 million business, why quit that to do something else? Yeah, it's a good question, but the roofing industry is like Hotel California. You can get in, but you never get out. <laughs> and so, um, I, you know, I may not be sponsoring a business right now, um, but uh, I'm always looking for a new opportunity. I look at myself as an entrepreneur first that happens to love the roofing industry. So I have successfully exited four businesses. and uh, All roofing? All roofing companies yeah what's the biggest one uh would have been aspen aspen was the biggest yeah what what was the revenue a uh, little over a hundred million i think it was 105 in 2011 okay. the year i sold it to my brother how did you come up with the and he, he's still in business he is yeah how did you come up with a mats guy so it's uh another interesting question so once eagle view was born there was another company called accurance you know, at Aspen and the company prior, um, you know, my talent really was recruiting and training salespeople. I've trained over 10,000 salesmen in this business. Wow. There's hundreds of companies. How do you train salespeople? Do you still believe that you have to know how to install? Because in the roofing industry, Absolutely. most people will argue with me that product doesn't matter, installation doesn't matter. 
Uh, and people argue that sales is a completely different skill set. It's objections, psychology, uh, reading people, and you still teach installation. Installation is probably the most important piece. And those who overlook it will fail or do fail. Um, sales is something that can be taught and you can overcome a lot um, by being a good salesman. People ask me all the time, what makes a good salesman? It's somebody who says, this is what I'm going to do and then actually does it. And so there's only three fundamentals in roofing, right? We sell, we build, we collect. It's pretty simple. And if you don't understand, kind of reverse engineer it, how do you collect your money? You got to do a good job for someone. Mm -hmm. How do you do a good job? Well, you got to understand how to tear a roof off without tearing apart the house or tearing apart the neighbor's house or, you know, making a big That's mess, happened. right? But, you know, a tear off's a really uh, important piece of the project and how you do that. Uh, it's just as important on how you install, what type of products do you install, um, who makes them, uh, and what are all the components that make up a roof system. A roof isn't just shingles, right? You've got all your metal, your underlayment, your ventilation, you know, your, sh your shingles are the biggest expense on a job, but it's the details that are the most critical. And if a salesman doesn't understand those critical details, they can expose you as the owner uh, to some serious losses. I've probably replaced well over a thousand roofs that we just did wrong in my career. And you just got to do the right thing and make the homeowner uh, whole and happy or else you're not going to collect your money. And so if you're not going to be willing to stand behind the work you do, then you probably shouldn't be in business in the first place. And if you're going to hire salespeople who don't understand how a roof is installed, um, then you're just creating a, your own little Wild West roofing organization where the salesmen and a lot of companies today, the salesmen run the roofing companies. For me as an owner, I knew that I'm going to run my salespeople. It's not going to be and there's the other no way. leverage, especially if you split the profit. Would you agree that split and profit is a mistake? For the business owners to agree? Well, seeing as it's the primary way I did business was the splits. Um, we, we paid the salesman a third of their 50% split for selling the job, a third for overseeing the production of the job, and a third to collect the money or payment in full, right? And so, if we had a good salesman who was just a gunslinger, sold a bunch of roofs and then left a book of business to be picked up by someone else, someone um, had to go through the production process and the collections process. So splitting the money up like that worked for me and worked for them. But, uh, you know, what, after being a salesman for a handful of years, my next opportunity was a sales manager. The first thing I did was hire a crew to come into my office and build a house, a mock house, right? Roof siding gutters, right? And we had uh, my first class, we had six salesmen. We were in Chicago. It was winter time. And these six salesmen in four months, all six of them sold over a million dollars that winter. But there was nothing on the exterior of a home these guys couldn't speak to. So when they were at the kitchen table, they would transfer the belief that they would, they know what they're talking about. And they're going to be the guy standing here during the job, right, to make sure things go well. And when after things go well, you know, we do all our work for free. We go out, we write estimates, measure roofs, you know, do in-home presentations. Uh, we order material, build relationships with the supply chain, uh, negotiate pricing, uh, coordinate uh, delivery, schedule the crews. Most of the crews don't speak English, right? And you put a lot of faith into the system that it'll work. And it, but if you don't manage that system, you will fail. Let's talk about Matt Sky. Tell me how you came up with the idea and all the way to the moment you decided to sell it. Yeah, so at Aspen, uh, I created a program, or the team created a program called the Relief Program. 
And it was something we conceptualized to go sell to insurance companies to partner with them. Most guys in the roofing industry like to say they work with insurance companies. You read it on their business cards, their websites. And, uh, you know, it's simply not true, right? Most guys like to fight with insurance companies. And, hey, I was that guy too, right? I've been called the Antichrist by top insurance companies, right? I, I, I have trained a lot of people how to go out and generate business, uh, you know, taking a hail swath and go solicit the area, do inspections. And, um, and so, you know, the, back in the, the 90s, we didn't have any of that technology. So, you know, you watch the Weather Channel, you heard about a storm in Zurich, Illinois, and you got in your truck and you drove to Zurich, Illinois to find out if there was damage. That's how we did it back in the Lake day. Lake Zurich was the first city. I was um, living in a car in 2005. I came here in 2005 and first month I was living in a car. Finally, you mentioned it. Lake Zurich. It was the lake where I was taking bath at night in September in Chicago. Because I, I was homeless in the beginning. Wow. So I can relate to that city. <laughs> it was just 15 years ago. Yeah. So that's how we used to do it back in the day. You know, pull out the maps. And, and insurance companies did not like what? What were you arguing about? So they would write estimate and you're like, it's not enough money or what was it? So that's a good question. I certainly can't speak for the insurance companies. I know what I saw our job to do was inspect every roof uh, in the area that we mapped out. So we'd take five or 10 guys and go drive the whole city. It used to take us a month to evaluate a storm and get our guys to the storm before they could get started selling. And we did sets. And so, uh, local yeah. <clears throat> And you know, so that process used to take a month. Well, now you can do that whole process in about two hours. And so, um, you know, back then, uh, compared to now, um, you know, you can, you can do things much faster. And so what I taught the sales guys to do is go pound every single door until we get an inspection. And we did that very thoroughly. And, uh, you know, what you find out there knocking doors is about a third of the homeowners after a hailstorm, they file a claim. The other, th the next third do what their neighbors do weeks or months later. The final third is uh, the, the homeowners that are waiting until the smoke clears, you know, to find out who the best contractor to hire is. And, um, and, and for me, you can't capitalize on the third one unless you do a good job for the second one. And if you're not there first, you're not going to win the storm. <laughs> right? and, and so and so for me, getting getting the guys there quickly, do, evaluating the storm and then hitting that storm as fast and as hard as we could before the competition moved in. What was very clear to me back then was what a wide open opportunity we had. There were just a half a dozen storm contractors that I knew, and uh, the chances of you running into them at a storm were not very high. However, the barriers to entry for, the, for someone to start a roofing business, those are also not very high. And so what I felt like we would do, and we have uh, over time, was created our own competition. Right. And so, you know, they by training sales guys that would go elsewhere or uh, he mentioned sets. For those of you guys who don't know what set is, set is where you come to local company, work under uh, their name and you do all the sales, sometimes production, but it's their name because you don't have time to get licensed. And so you essentially would be teaching those companies you work for how to do business. Yeah, and you know, we'd leave a, a wake of devastation in our path, right? So we would go into a town, do a set, and um, you know, maybe the guy's been in business for 30 years or 10 years, got a good reputation, a local phone number, and uh, we would utilize those pieces of their business and build our own in that town. And what would happen is, the sets themselves, they, they would be a little bit delusional very quickly about their immediate success. So we had, 
I remember one time walking through the past sets that we'd done. One guy committed suicide, several divorces, people hooked on drugs, went to jail. What led to too much money, too quick? Too much, too fast. Too much, too fast. And they just didn't know how to handle it. Are you talking about business owners? Yeah who you brought all the business these are guys we went into their city partnered with them used their name and, and now uh, show, they were not ready for the growth they weren't ready for the growth and then um you know a lot of times when you do a set the set is responsible for the warranties when the stormer leaves and so you know maybe there's an escrow agreement and they spent the money or you know things happen right can you explain the set and do you see a lot of sets now like what, what's the ideal set percentages so you go sell for them how much business owners should get what's fair yeah to i have our warranty calls like you mentioned yeah to do it right it probably needs to be around five percent we always tried to negotiate down to about three percent mm -hmm. and you so know, if I, you sell ten million dollars i get five hundred thousand dollars for my correct. business correct yeah. we're gonna borrow your name we're going to provide all the material and, and that resources. should cover in your opinion all the warranties for the next 10 15 years well back then we only gave a three-year warranty I see. right and so you know generally speaking we would be at a storm for two years today there's no such thing as a storm that lasts two years sure. you know hurricane laura, laura that's coming might be an exception but back then, you know, it took us a month to get set up and then it, we would sell in that city under that set for a year, year and a half till the storm dried up. And sometimes we'd have multiple storms hit while we were there. And so by the time we left, we'd already handled most of the warranties that existed or that the set would be responsible for. But it didn't mean that they had accepted personal responsibility for their newfound wealth right? Because they still operated their own businesses still. So the $500,000 was just free money to them mm -hmm. that they didn't have to work real hard for. But if they misused that money, and <laughs> a lot of them did, right? Um, you know, I just no longer felt comfortable doing sets. It was great because we got to borrow someone's credibility in a local market, but it's the primary reason why I chose to start Aspen Contracting. And everyone told me I was crazy that you can't start a national roofing company doing residential roofing. And I thought, well, you know, the way I was raised was doing the right thing. You can do anything. And what's wrong with going into a new town and telling people the truth about who you are, where you're from, and doing business, you know, the transparent way. What, was it much harder versus doing with established companies? Yes, it was much harder, especially early on. You know, I imagine knocking a door and you don't have a single reference, right? Any new roofing company owner knows what that feels like when you first start out. The odds are certainly stacked against you. And so, it, you know, it requires some discipline to stay out there, keep telling your story and fight for what you believe in. If you think you're doing the right thing, the market will tell you if you are or aren't. How do you explain to the homeowners if you're not local, uh, who's gonna uh, pay for the warranties? And Because now you don't have those local sets and the local business owner. What's your objection and how do you overcome that? Yeah, so that was a thing. Um, you know, normally after a hailstorm, if you get your roof replaced, you're not supposed to need a new roof for like 30 years. If you right? did it right. If you did it right. And so what we saw was we would go do these sets and we would re-roof an entire town. And then we would leave that town. And guess what happens to the set? They spent all the money we paid them. And their business is now suffering because there's no roofs to do in the town. And so when I started Aspen, it wasn't we're going to leave a, a warranty with a set. We're going to own and honor the warranty and just handle it from national headquarters and hire guys that we used to do sets to go handle our warranties for us. So if you would get a call, you would essentially call someone local to do the job. That's right. I see. 
back to Metsky. How all of that help you come up with the Metsky business? Yeah, so I was telling you about the relief program. Yep. We went and pitched it to a couple of insurance executives who uh, thought it was a good idea, but weren't interested in the time for what was reasons. relief. How did you explain so the that? Aspen Leaf, Aspen. right? So it was relief program, okay. and so that was kind of version one of an insurance managed repair program. And um, and your agenda was you wanted to insur for insurance companies to give jobs directly to you to Aspen. That's right. And why would they do that? That was that was my question. Actually, my question is why wouldn't they do that? Right. We're a national roofing company and, um, you know, we obviously respond very quickly in storms and uh, can, you know, have the credit and cash capabilities to uh, meet the demand that existed. At least, you know, we thought we did at the time. So we went and pitched this to insurance companies. And although it didn't work out then, um, I stayed in touch with those insurance executives. You mentioned you do ice damming. Mm -hmm. Um, well, in February 2015, there was 150, 160 inches of snow that fell over the northeast um, Boston area. I was there. I was working there. Oh, were you? Yeah. So they were having a really hard time finding people that could remove the ice dams and fix the properties. And uh, that one of those insurance executives that I had met five or six years before reached out and said, can you help? And uh, we scrambled and uh, we helped them out and evidently captured their attention because uh, about six months later, that same gentleman reached out and said, you know, we're looking to build a managed repair program internally. We've been working on it for a couple of years. And we realized uh, once we went to pull a permit, how difficult and complex this really is. And I thought, uh, okay, how can I help? He said, you know, will you help us build it? And I thought, wow, this is the opportunity that I've been looking for. And so um, we spent the next six months uh, road mapping the design of the program and born was Mad Sky. I love the name of the Mad Sky. Uh, many don't know the story. Mad Sky has nothing to do with the sky. It has to do something with your daughters. Tell me that story. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the gifts I got from Mad Sky was getting off the road. I've lived in 30 plus states at one point or another. And, you know, my kids were growing up and I didn't get to experience that. Uh, so with the concept of Mad Sky, I was going to get to stay at home. And although we hadn't given it a name yet, my wife and I were kicking it around. an idea. Yeah. How, how to stay at home and still be in business. That's right. So my wife is who actually who named the company Mad Sky. She said, why don't we name it after our two oldest daughters, Madison and Skylar. So Mad Sky was born. Love it. Absolutely love it. Comment below what you guys think. Um, so fast forward, so it's just 2015, 2016 is born four years today. You're no longer owner, but you sold it. So you run Mad Sky for four years. Yeah. So like I mentioned, I've exited four businesses. Um, all four of them have averaged about a five year ownership span. And so I love to create new concepts execute those plans. And then, you know, I'm more of an entrepreneur than a leader, right? So I like to create the concept and, and, and get, get the plan a solid foundation and then hand it over to a buyer who's going to bring the leadership skills to take it to the next level. I can see that. And Matt Sky, was it the plan from the beginning to sell it or always always yeah all the concepts i'm pondering today all have an exit strategy um was it successful which cup mad, uh, sky? mad sky i guess that would depend on who you ask to me it was wildly successful i believe managed repair is the future of insurance claims you think so i have no doubt 
today you've, you've been heavily criticized uh, sure. for Mad Sky, and I want to talk about how insurance do business and why we cannot do what other industry is like medical you know other industry you know if you have hell on your car you, you go to Abra insurance actually say hey go to this shop why we can't do it in roofing business well, you know, it's an interesting question that a lot of really smart people with a lot of money are trying to answer. And the answer is, is every home is unique. But but is is it the problem though? I, I feel like the answer is, I feel like it's not about houses. We can fix the house. I feel like there's so many moving parts sure. because you have storm chasers and you have local. So like uh, for insurance company to send business to local abra shop or local hospitals one thing yeah. but for insurance company to send um you know business to not a local roofer but to storm chaser or chuck in the truck so you have three players in the market you have chucks in the trucks you have local roofers and you have storm chasers i think those th the categories the labor pool and who's doing the work is more challenging than the work itself would you agree Houses are different, like it's, but our bodies are different. Imagine, you know, a medical field, uh, you know, like supplementing there and working on, on your bodies, right? It's very complicated. Cars are complicated, but it's business, like it's right here. In our business, you have so much in, and I see insurance companies saying, well, we can't, treat this contractor like in the medical field you can treat everyone as you know all the doctors are the same you know the same with you know abra shops they're all the same in our industry you have three different categories and you can't say well you know this job is ten thousand dollars well is it fair to give this guy ten thousand dollar job this guy ten thousand and this guy ten thousand we, we can figure out the job sure. but for me that's the 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 hardest part to to um to level the playing field because it's so uneven. We don't have true professionals across the board. It's, it's all over. Yeah, there's no doubt the roofing industry is quite sloppy and unorganized. What medical and auto had that roofing doesn't is uh, data, right? So I can promise you medical and auto were as clunky, complicated, sure. scary, as roofing is today. But there's, there's, there's something I want to hone in on here. The insurance companies, most, what I've learned, think about it this way. I was, I was in the roofing industry for 25 years when I got asked to partner with one of them, truly partner. And I thought I knew everything there was to know about an insurance claim when I got that phone call. What the five year history taught me was I really didn't know anything. <laughs> the insurance companies are very, very large organizations. And most of them consider themselves financial stewards, right? That sell a policy to a homeowner and then try and react quickly and efficiently and fairly when there's a storm. So why doesn't that work with a contractor with the same motivation, right? Well, the simple answer is, we're so used to fighting with insurance companies as contractors. Um, you know, the ivory tower for the insurance executive, um, you know, they have to manage thousands of field adjusters, thousands of desk adjusters, all of which have a different opinion about how things in the world work. Then they have to follow different types of policies. And then what standard is there that exists for hail and da wind damage assessment. And I'm just talking about the roof, right? It gets a lot more complicated with all the other trades, siding, windows, gutters, state regulation, interior repairs. How many contractors do you know that can do a full scope of repair, regardless of the event that occurred? And what I've learned is the storm chasers are not real good at partnering with insurance companies, they've got a different mindset. So like at Mad Sky, we tried to partner with local companies that had pride in what they did, could react quickly upon an event occurring, and then follow the guidelines that are brought forth by the insurance community 
that says when a claim occurs, here's, here's how we'd like to see things played out. I can promise you the insurance companies, all my dealings with them, they want to do the right thing for the homeowner. They try real hard to, and sometimes they make mistakes, like all of us do. And most of them own it very quickly. But, you know, this is a complex world we live in. There's not a lot of data. This is one of the insurance companies. Roofing is one of their biggest spends, if not the biggest spend. And, you know, they have all sorts of departments. They don't just do hail claims, right? Sure. Um, and so they, they have uh, quite an infrastructure uh, to support what they stand behind when they sell a policy. And if you've ever hired, trained, and tried to motivate thousands of people, you know it's very difficult to get everyone on the same page. And so when I, when I step back and think about my roofing career as a storm chaser, you know, you'd meet one adjuster with company X and then another one across the street with the same company, and you'd have two completely different outcomes. And that's really due to the knowledge that that field adjuster has. How experienced are they? And what tools are they using? And is there a different policy written? Was there a prior storm event? There's but we also see the averages, you know, across the country. Uh, I talk to a lot of, you know, public adjusters, supplementers, and I would say industry average, most people agree that insurance companies shorten their initial estimates by, you know, 20, 25% when the adjuster comes out, like almost blindly just, okay, here's the estimate. And you look at it, it's like you're 25%, 30% short. And people don't realize that insurance adjuster often expect you know, supplements. Okay, if I miss it, just add to it. But then negotiation starts. And now you have this average where we're frustrated to work with them. We feel like they're always at war with us. They're always shorting us. Nobody likes to get shortened. Sure. And But I think it also happens in the medical field too. I talk to um, a few doctors and stuff and they say like, for example, when you give birth, you know, it's $15,000 operation, but uh, hospitals usually get about 80% of that money. So they, the same thing, they send $15,000 bill and they settle for like 12. So the game is everywhere. My question is, if you look at the insurance numbers and their data, you know, like collecting $65 billion in premiums and paying out only $5 billion, but fighting us contractors for 20, 25%, I'm like, you know, if you spend extra billion, you, you keep everybody's happy. You keep contractors happy. You keep homeowners happy. That's your best advertising money. You know, why not do it that way? You're spending billions, you know, advertising in business on the stadiums. You can spend extra 20, 25%, resist a little bit less. I, I'm like, and that's my problem with insurance companies. When, when you see the pattern of denials where like everybody makes mistakes, I agree with you. But when there's a pattern, it's, it's now it's behavior. Now you're a bad guy. You know, if you're the boss and you're shorting your sales rep, you didn't pay him on one or two jobs, you made a mistake, it's one thing. But I know companies, and maybe you've seen too, where owner comes in, takes 200 invoices, put it on general uh, manager table and say, nobody gets paid what they claim. You know, I've seen this practice and I feel like something like that happens in the insurance world where it's like, you know, we're not going to approve all the claims, everything they ask. We're going to shorten everything because they know if you don't pay, you know, hundred dollars per claim, now you just make extra hundred million dollars. That's the problem too. And Matt Sky were kind of, you know, you negotiate the price. Now we almost have to agree with the price, right? So you pretty much have to settle. Okay. The price is the price. Don't ask for more. And it becomes a bulk game. Yeah. So first, you know, you said level the playing field a little while ago. Let me start with, um, as a storm contractor, I felt like there were good and bad actors on the insurance side. I felt very similar to the way you feel or have expressed to me how you and the roofing community feel about insurance companies. What I can tell you is that's very wrong. Now, as a contractor, I've never seen an insurance estimate on a roof that I agreed with. Every single one of them can be improved. I've got 150,000 roofs under my belt. That means we probably estimated 500,000 roofs. 
seen insurance scopes, sure. right? And although every single estimate can be improved on, and you know, there's a word that's used, maximize the claim, right? Well, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. And what I've seen in the last 10 years develop that I've not seen in my career is the greed by the contractors, not the insurance companies. That takes place too. You but know, but we, insurance can be greedy too. Listen, I can tell you that the product teams that sell the insurance policy and the claims team that manage the claims, they're working independently, right? The claims team, I've never, I've worked in, I've been inside these big insurance companies. I can tell you, denying or delaying or whatever other tactics. <laughs> have, right? have you re read that book, Deny, Delay? No, I think I've just heard it so many times over my career. Um, my experience partnering with them is it couldn't be more untrue. They want to pay. They want to do the right thing. And... Um, you know, I think contractors can't appreciate that because of all the friction they feel in the field. But I can tell you, I worked with a lot of insurance executives and thousands of uh, desk adjusters and field adjusters, and I've never seen one of them try and take advantage of a policyholder or insist that we did. Do you feel like Matt Sky originally got a lot of uh, pushback from contractors and criticism because of our uh, perception of insurance companies because we already have bad taste in our mouth how insurance companies work with us and we, because we thought you were a sellout did people call you sellout <laughs> so my whole career I've been attacked for trying to be a leader right and I've built some big businesses in the roofing industry and whether I was a successful salesman, sales manager, general manager, partner, owner, I've been attacked my whole career. And if the roofing company, if the roofing industry would come together versus try and be the smartest guy in the room, stop pulling each other apart, right? There are, the insurance community pays for a third of all roofs replaced in America. One third. One third. The biggest buyer. They buy more shingles than any of us, right? And they want to partner with the roofing community, but the roofing community has to want to partner back with insurance companies. And you what does it mean? Do we have to agree with their pricing, with their conditions? Like, how does it look? When you say they want to partner, how does it look? Yeah, so, so I guess when I happen? say partner is, it's been my experience, they want to be fair, right? They don't want to deal with egotistical maniacs, right? That believe they have mastered the art of Xactimate, right? Xactimate is a complex system and uh, there's different ways to use it. Right? But would you agree that Xactimate is something that insurance companies and the contractors finally agreed on as equalizer? Like you agreed on this items, you know, and the pricing, it's... Xactimate is le leveling the playing field, isn't it? What makes in, it complicated? In some ways, yes, but let's not give that much credit to one company, okay. right? It's the use of that technology that determines the outcome. But the insurance companies came up with it. So I can't speak to how Xactimate was invented, uh, but what I can speak to is how it's used. There are schools and classes that you we can- We have one, we endorse, yeah. That you can go to and um, different levels of certification. And the more savvy of a user you become, the more confidence you have of writing an estimate and maximizing the claim, right? which is something, you know, when an adjuster goes to write an estimate, they're looking at what's damaged, what's covered, and how do I get a check to the policyholder? It's pretty simple. Contractors thinking about his new truck he wants to buy with a new lift kit, and if I take the head off of the carrier on this claim, then I'll be able to buy my new truck. 
And that kind of mentality needs to go away, right? You take the good with the bad and you stay away from the ugly, right? You know, when I started, uh, deductibles were 200, 300 bucks. Today, they're two or 3,000. There's a lot of ACV policies versus RCV policies. And, you know, insurance claims are not getting easier, more simple. They're getting more complicated. And, you know, as a roofer, speaking to the roofer community, stop trying to know everything because you're not going to ever know everything. Be fair in the way you deliver your service. You told the homeowner when you signed them up on a contingency contract that you were going to work with their insurance company. But you go back to your office in, in your war room and plan your attack. I hate that word. Like, <laughs> I, I tell everyone, I never have a war room in any of my offices. Like, who are we in war with? Like, stop saying that. Like, meeting room, well, you're, planning room. Well, all you're room. doing is creating a war, right? You're creating a war. You know, and you can be blackballed from the insurance community. Comment below if you have war room in your business. <laughs> and so, listen, I'm certainly not against making a profit. But let's be fair, right? And generally any business, if you can make a 30% margin when all is said and done, that's pretty impressive. Those and yeah, and you don't have to be a savvy Xactimate user or hire public adjusters and a legal team to fight a $10,000 roof claim. If you're a roofer and you understand your trade and your skill, you understand what the cost to replace that roof should be. But with that, we just have a um, um, way interview um, ban uh, in Minneapolis, traveling sales rep. So he's Chase Storms, worked for local roofing companies, a great guy. And they have 30 claims now, like this year, I think it's either all state or state farm just denies everything. Like go on a roof, you see the damage and they have 30 appraisals and they have to have appraisals. He said, like, I can't, I can't look in homeowners. I say, well, sorry, your neighbors are getting roofs. You're not. So I agree with you that we should not be hiring public adjusters and appraisals. So I actually have never hired, like we have one appraisal in like four years, but there's definitely companies who abuse it, but there is definitely companies who have to use it. And we, we also have a trend of all these niches. You have, you know, exactly trainers, you have public adjusters, you have lawyers, everybody's on the rise. And the reason they're on the rise is because of the practices on the other end. And someone will abuse it, someone will use it as a tool. What's your take on appraisals and public adjusting? Stop the madness. Stop it, right? It's not good for our industry, right? Yeah. I know lawyers that are bad actors. Sure. I don't know very many lawyers that, matter of fact, I've never had a lawyer help me on an insurance claim with one of my customers. Really? Never. Now, See? now this coming from a guy who's upset probably every insurance company out there, right? For one reason or another. And you upset roofers too. And you probably roofers. upsetting them Absolutely, now, <laughs> right? I know they don't want to hear, hear that. But, but listen, clear. today, less than 1% of all roof claims go through managed repair. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. If you expect to be in the insurance restoration business in the future, take heed to this warning. You don't want to be blackballed by the insurance community for being an over-aggressive bad actor. Sure. Right? You want to be fair. Right? What I would recommend to that contractor in Minneapolis who's had 30 denials in a row is maybe look at where you're working and maybe look at your level of education because obviously there's something you're doing that is creating that friction. And it's really hard to look yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I'm blaming this guy and that guy or this insurance company and that insurance company. 
But we're talking about one insurance. So, you know, if, if company works in one area and they get approvals, you know, clear damage, they can approve, uh, get approvals from most companies, but there, there is one company. And it, it's weird how it happens. Sometimes it's state farms, sometimes all states, sometimes it's farmers, whatever, like different markets. I don't know if it's what's going on on the back end. Maybe insurance just saying we don't have money. We, we, we paid way too much this year. I don't know. The insurance companies have a lot of money. They, right. they do, but, but they change their behavior. Sometimes they pay too much and you surprise us like, you're going to pay for this? Wow, that was easy. And sometimes you're not going to pay for obvious. Like, how do we react and adjust to that? So I would challenge you, Dimitri, to not accept that, that roofer's word for it. Yeah. He's telling you his side of the story. Sure. But obviously there's another side to this story. Sure. And, you know... As a contractor who's worked at almost every market in the country, I've worked with hundreds of insurance companies. When they flag your number, your days are numbered. Really? Well, listen, there's guys out there that'll call in a claim because it rained. Not because there's substantial damage to a roof, right? You know, we talked about guys that lack installation knowledge. There's a lot more sure. that lack claims knowledge. They think they're a claims expert, expert. They think they're a roofing expert. And chances are they're neither, right? Because if, if anybody that strikes out 30 times in a row with one insurance company, something's wrong there. And it's probably the roofer, not the insurance company. I listen, I've had all, all the battles everybody's had with insurance companies up on a roof. What's damaged, what's not, what's covered, what's not, what's the state regulations. I've ha fought all those battles and all those battles create friction. And all that friction is bad for our industry. This is coming from the guy who started out as a storm chaser when there weren't storm chasers who developed a concept of a revolving door theory, hiring salespeople and training them and putting them in the streets. A lot of them today are successful roofing company owners. But I can promise you any roofing company owner that involves themselves with insurance claims tries to position themselves as a fair contractor. But if you go back to your war room and you hire your PA or your Xactimate guru that's trying to get everything from the roof to the foundation paid for, right? A, a $10,000 roof shouldn't cost $30,000. And I know there's been a lot of folks out there trying to teach contractors how to maximize their profit. Look, it's not illegal to make a profit, but it's also not the right thing to do to create the friction in the market where your greed for profit determines your reputation with those paying for it. When you partner with an insurance company, you now have two customers. You have the homeowner and the insurance company. And they don't accept, uh, you know, I always like to say to the insurance guys, even good contractors have bad days and make mistakes and hire crews that had no business being on that roof or left a mess or nails in the driveway. If the contractors will just take a deep breath, right? And if they want insurance companies to keep everything I own has been paid for by insurance companies from my efforts of roofing. So if you step back and you think about what's the next 10 years, 30 years of my career look like, are you going to do insurance restoration? If you are, why don't you think about what, what a good partnership to you looks like from their perspective? You certainly have a lot of opinion about insurance companies. Have you ever asked them what their opinion of you are? That's a great question. Love it. Um, I want to challenge you on the business model of Matt Sky. I feel like one of the pushback and criticism um, comes with, from the contractor, actually read it in comments. Uh, because if you break down the business of MedSky, you are not managing program, you are contractor. 
And I know you've, uh, like earlier I was listening uh, your interview with Delmedica, you said it in that interview that you're not a contractor, you're an MPR uh, management program. But if you look at the business model, uh, explain to me how MadSky is not a general contractor business. You buy materials, you hire a contractor, you have a profit margin. Technically speaking, you're a general contractor, which is genius business model. It's a compliment. But many contractors look at MadSky just like I'm working for the country, even including with your rates. Like I think uh, you, you mentioned $75 to $100 you know, labor and suggesting that 50% should go to the crew, 50% should go to the con company, but I know the going rate from like, we're struggling now. We hiring subs at $75, $200, you know, that's how we pay, but Metzke pay us. So it feels like we're working for the builder or for the general contractor. What makes uh, Metzke not a general contractor? Yeah, so this coming from a guy at my Aspen days, we had a license in over 5,000 cities, right? 5,000 cities. 5,000 different municipalities. And that was about 40 states. 40 states. Yeah. And so, you know, to be, you know, the definition of luck is when preparedness meets opportunity. And so it was my job to make sure that Aspen was prepared to execute on a storm as soon as it hit so we could be there quickly so we had to get, do all the testing register the company and get set up to do business prior to an event occurring and so we created like 5,000 target cities across the country uh, based on you know homeowner occupancies home values and then take a swath storm swath overlay and evaluate a storm a little bit differently than anybody else was doing it. And when a storm hit, we could send a hundred sales guys there tomorrow and be selling uh, with our nationally branded company. And so when I think about um, you know what it's to, what it's like to be a general contractor, because you know we're talking about roofing, but most of the contractors in your audience are general contractor a lot we actually have big big audience who are just roofers we actually have a lot of guys who install every day and uh, a huge audience is actually retail my audience I, th I would say more retail than in the restoration a lot of guys don't even work with the claims trying to get to it so we're trying to educate them so but a majority of our audience are roofers which is I agree like roofing company is general contractor company uh, mo most, most are and interesting you point that out and i'll get to your question in a moment but when you think about working for a homeowner working with insurance companies every hailstorm is different right you know you might have large hail that falls straight down you might have one inch hail with 60 mile an hour winds right when the hail hits the home is your company prepared to restore the full home to its pre-storm condition, or do you just do the roof? Insurance companies want to partner with a contractor that can do the full scope of repair. So can you fix the fence, the deck? Can you paint? Can you do siding? Can you do windows? There's interior damage, can you fix those? And there's so much focus on the roof. But I can tell you the guys who focus on the other trades on insurance work are the guys who win and win big because the homeowner doesn't want to have to hire. They don't even want to get three bids, right? Let alone three bids from guys who can do pieces of their puzzle. They want to, to be able to hand a five page estimate to a contractor and say, just fix it. And most contractors that call them, most roofers that call themselves general contractors really aren't, right? And, you know, the guys that understand that and truly understand that if they're going to partner with an insurance company, they need to do full scope of repair and not just the roof and the gutters because on this job we're getting a full gutter replacement. And so the guys that take that a little more seriously do a lot better in program work. Well, 
b big reason why they don't do it. Uh, like we, we do most of it. So I'm a general contractor. I have a general contractor license in Minneapolis. One of the reasons we don't like to do fencing or we do gutters, a lot gutters, siding, but uh, profit margins. You know, you don't make as much money, um, you know, on the gutters, for example, for years, we would be losing money. And we still would do it because that's what's good for the homeowner, for the claim, to get the roof, to take care of the entire claim. I agree with you. It's better for the consumer. But when you see Xactimate or insurance company paying you as much as you paying, you know, your sub, sometimes even they pay you less than it cost you. That's where the whole struggle begins. That's why we're like, you know what? We're not going to do those trades. We're just going to focus here because business comes first, profit first. And I can't blame contractors who do that. It's not like we don't want to please the customer, but when, you know, you can't make money on painting job, drywall job, why do it? Like you, you're in business to make money. What, what's your answer to that? Like if, so you, if, this... you, if you cannot show me how I'm making money, yeah. why you want me to do it? So I don't disagree that some of the line items in Xactimate are not as well positioned as say the roofing components are, sure. right? Painting and windows are big ones, yes. right? And the adjusters, they struggle with it too, right? Because contractors are saying you're not paying enough to fix this or paint that wall. And, you know, they the, the adjuster is limited in their abilities to pay out over and above that, right? And so it's up to the contractor to position a good argument, right? Without all the aggressive nature behind it, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, for instance, if a window's gonna cost a thousand dollars, which to me is pretty cheap when, you know, some of the large manufacturers uh, charge eight or 10 times that amount, mm -hmm. right? then why is Xactimate paying for a $350 window here? And why would I, as a contractor, want to perform that work? Well, w the way I would approach that is I'm going to reposition the argument. First of all, this is a $20,000 roof job. I want it. I'll do the $350 window. That would be my first thought. My second thought is if I need more than $350 on this window and I'm not willing to borrow from say the roof profit, then I need to go out and get three bids myself from subcontractors who will install this particular window, present them to the adjuster and say, here's my market conditions are saying I've got three bids, they average $1,200, you're paying 350, right? Can you tell me if there's anything more over and above what Xactimate says to pay that you'd be willing to pay for? That doesn't always work, right? And that gets guys that are real aggressive fired up and they want to go hire a PA and, you know, beat their chest and be, you know, very forceful in their approach with the adjuster who's you're not going to win favor of, right? Help the adjuster position to their boss why they should pay more without just saying, well, it's my market and you don't know anything and Xactimate isn't paying enough and I demand you pay this or we're going to appraisal or I'm hiring the lawyers now. That's, that's not good for business. And contractors who believe it is won't be in business much longer. I mean, it's a statistic. 97% of contractors will go out of business in the next five years. 97. 97%. I heard like more like 95, 94, but 97. Yeah. I mean, in my career, insurance adjusters, I mean, this is before I partnered with insurance companies, field adjusters would send me referrals constantly to the point I couldn't even run them all because I didn't want to run all over town chasing down those leads. But if you will maybe just back off and think of a new approach to represent your business, your service, your offering in a new light, that might take you five extra minutes. Nobody wants to go get three bids for a $350 window. But guess what? If you don't, why should a big insurance company take your word for it? What makes you more credible than them? Right? This is what Xactimate, who's got more data, on market pricing than all of us, right? Because they've organized it, right? They, they're they not always right. And once upon a time, 
it wasn't that good of a tool for roofing. It is now. It, guys have gotten so good at component pricing and maximizing the claim. O and P on the roof is a thing of the past. It's because of behavior. I mean, before we were aggressive and greedy in our approach, they were happy to pay O and P. So, Mad Sky is a general contractor or not? No, Mad Sky was never designed to be a contractor of any sorts. Mad Sky was designed to uh, work with the insurance companies to take their leads, right, and give them to a roofing community that was pre screened and vetted. They have a home improvement license, they're properly insured or bonded, and uh, gone through a criminal background check. I mean, that's what most of the programs are. But you take a cut, just like a GC would. Like, you, you, right. you outsource labor and you... So you deal with materials, just like general contractor. You outsource the labor. So Guy doesn't outsource labor. Well, you... I, you, I, don't, I don't think contractor if, connection... If I'm, a, if I'm on the... But you're outsourcing to me. So all you do... And I think that's why... I think here's my problem with Metsky, and, and, and you guys can comment if you agree. Metsky, Metsky is a great concept for insurance companies. It's a great attempt to fix the big problem. But I think at the end of the day, it did not fix that big of a problem. Like, for example, like I think what, what you did fix, the problems you solved, was lead generation. So you put us in a, uh, in, on the markets right after the storm. That's great. That was a big problem for a lot of contractors. You solved that problem, but we don't have a problem like where to buy materials. So, if we, you know, you say you have like 3000, you know, like shops or whatever with uh, suppliers. I don't think it's a problem that we struggle. If you give me a lead and a job, I'll like ABC or Beacon is not a problem, right? Yes. So let me answer your question. So there's been other attempts at roofing programs by multiple insurance companies and multiple managed repair programs. I had participated in some of those in my prior life as a roofer, and I did not like them, right? Why didn't I like them? Because they really didn't provide me as a roofer much value, right? I was a hunter, I'm going out and I'm getting the business. I don't, I don't need someone to send it to me or hand it to me. So I also didn't uh, like the fact that most of my salesmen couldn't write an estimate to save their life in Xactimate. And with insurance programs, you've got to follow all these technological requirements and guidelines. And the roofing community just wasn't ready for that back in the 90s, 2000s. Where your class A general contractors, your big name, big brand companies, those guys are positioned and have uh, really stabilized the water mitigation, build back, you know, fire mold. They've conquered that space, but they couldn't and haven't conquered roofing. And so, but the question is why? Why, why is roofing so much different and so much more complicated? Well, when you look at what a contractor does, most roofing contractors do two, 300 roofs a year. Most of them, mm -hmm. okay? Most have one or two or maybe three salesmen. And the owner may have perfect intentions to partner with an insurance company. It doesn't mean their full team has bought into that concept. Sure. And one of the things that happens after an event occurs to a local contractor who has a $30,000 credit line at the supply house and you have 500 leads to send them, they can't perform. They can't, they can't run all those leads, first of all. And second of all, if they sold all those jobs, they'd have to call someone about getting a loan. And so when, when I st started you know, my experience with other programs, got a call to partner with one, and started interviewing contractors about the concept I was creating, many of them said, LC, I can't build 100 jobs in a week. I don't have the money to do it. And so I, I thought- you provide the capital? Well, we don't provide, well, you, the you idea buy the wasn't provide capital, yeah, materials. but provide the credit facility so they can order materials for the job on our account. 
that seemed to work really well for some and really not so well for others. And the argument has always been, I want my $2, my $2 rebate, or whatever it is, right? The truth is, you can't order $300,000 worth of material this week if called upon. That's the problem. And so by giving the contractor the ability and flexibility to order material from wherever and whoever they want, well, we get accounts set up everywhere. We're happy to pay for it, but you figure out what needs to go on the roof, you order it, logistically you handle it, right? And then you as the home improvement contractor that has subcontractors for each trade, you figure out the labor side of it. So when I look at Mad Sky or Contractor Connection or Lackerty, right, these programs are designed to put and separate the contractor and the insurance company, almost become the, the, the guiding light for the contractor to follow to perform well so that the insurance company wants to keep sending leads your way. It's pretty simple. I want to ask my audience. Would you call Matt Sky a general contractor or manage and repair program? And I'm not trying to stir the pot. I'm just calling, a, like, I just want to give a name to it. Because for me, I felt like I'm working for, I'm taking a job from another company, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's a business and it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a great business model. Um, why did you decide to sell it when you decided to sell it? So timing's everything, right? I had a lot of offers to buy the business from me. I wasn't ready to sell it. I, my first year in business, I had full, uh, big offers to buy the business and the business wasn't even mature yet. And so, um, you know, through ongoing discussions with, you know, family offices, private equity firms, uh, strategic investors, uh, finally found a partner who wanted to buy the business for what I felt were the right reasons to help grow the business. And so, you know, I'm still an advisor with Mad Sky and uh, talk to the CEO frequently, but I'm not active daily in any way. How big is Mad Sky now? Uh, I can't speak to that. You can't, well, like a team, like what's the, uh, what's the capacity? You said that all uh, um, management programs less than 1%. Uh, what's the workload that Mad Sky can do? because it's such a small percentage. I know we tried it in Minneapolis and we have a hard time because we didn't get enough leads. Even when, you know, I guess it might work like I, I didn't test it after recent storms, but when we tried, you know, program, we just didn't have any increase. I, I think Metzke sent us like five, six uh, estimates and we couldn't get any jobs. It was either no damage or, you know, a situation like that. So what's the capacity now? Can you take care of the big storms or? So I'm not involved in the business, so I can't speak to it. When, when, know, when, you, when, you when I designed the business, um, you, you know, my my goal was to grow the business as large and as scalable as I could, right? And that takes an extraordinary effort internally and externally. So you not only need a good team, but you need a good network, right? And you need good customers, for good insurance companies to partner with, right? The, uh, Mad Sky and companies like Mad Sky are in a very difficult position to please everyone, right? And the contractors sometimes join programs with high expectations. Um, but I promise the programs also have high expectations. And sometimes expectations collide and people have a bad experience bad outcome. I can tell you my whole career, whether I owned a roofing company or a managed repair program, every day was a hard day. Every day I wanted to quit. And every day you stay focused on the goal of what you're trying to achieve. What I tried to do with Mad Sky was bring the roofing and insurance communities together, not further apart, not try to take something from one or the other. Sure but try and fill in the gaps where maybe the contractors or the insurance companies don't have the skills or uh, the, the required education, right? To bring every homeowner across the country 
back to their pre-storm condition. It is very hard to do. And so when I, when I think about partnering with contractors, what do you need from me? What do I need from you? Because we're all trying to please the homeowner, right? And where we used to go out and knock doors or generate leads through other means, today we have the source and the checkbook saying, hey, do X, Y, and Z, and there's more of this to come. And all you have to do is perform. Sure. And so that doesn't mean that the TPA, the managed repair program, always performs either, right? So they're, you know, these programs are highly dependent on their team, their technologies, uh, you know, various partnerships in the ecosystem. And providing the perfect outcome for every homeowner is very difficult to do. Providing a great contractor experience is also very difficult to do. Most managed repair programs, whether medical, auto, or construction, right, have experienced highs and lows, right? I could promise the medical and the auto, they were very dysfunctional when they began. <clears throat> in, the, in the networks I joined as a roofer also felt dysfunctional. What's the percentage in those industries now, like in auto, uh, you mentioned it's less than 1% in construction. In auto, how many claims get referred or used? I, I don't know the answer, but I think it's as high as 50% on the auto side. Feels like it. Um, is it easier to build a MRP program or a contracting business? Because you, you, you please in different crowds. Is it easier to please homeowner or please insurance and contractor? Contractor is not easy to deal with. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I would get a lot of phone calls from, you know, acquaintances in the roofing industry. What are you doing with this managed repair program? And, um, you know, as a contractor, trying to please in insurance companies was not on my agenda. My agenda was the homeowner. My agenda was my team. And, um, you know, I thought by partnering with insurance companies uh, that we could have this glorious outcome where everybody got along in a new world. A managed repair program is a thousand times harder than the largest roofing company I've ever built. If I had to do it all over again, I would have sampled more of the roofers in the community about their wishes and wants of building the program and maybe designed a few things a little differently. Um, but if you're just asking me, uh, what would I start if I had to do it all over again? It would be a roofing company. It's just a lot easier business to consumer versus business to business trying to provide a service to the consumer. Do you feel like big players, especially in the uh, roofing industry, like to play with the big players, like, you know, insurance companies, you know, the big dogs, the big billion dollar companies, they merge, they do business with other billion sure. dollar companies. And maybe there is a little bit tension there because we're too small for them. You know, like, I feel like when, when you deal with a billion dollar corporation and your $5 million business for you, especially if you have a roofing ego, a roofing uh, business owner ego, you think you made it, you $5 million business. For them, you're like no one. And I think uh, what you've tried to build, you have leverage. Now, you know, like program that worth maybe half a billion dollars, maybe a hundred million dollars. I think they treat you a little bit different. Is it true or false that companies like Aspen do have maybe special treatment with the bigger companies or no? No, I don't think so. You don't think so? No, when the bigger companies have more risk, because they're taking on more business. It's as simple as that. You're, you're dependent on more people on so your team. So you don't team. have leverage there? No. Whether you're big or small no. for insurance companies, it doesn't matter. No, look, I, I mentioned everybody makes mistakes, right? But it's a lot harder to manage a professional roofing company with hundreds or thousands of people on your team that also have different agendas and motivations in their lives. Uh, managing a small business, um, you have a lot more control. And, you know, it's been my experience that insurance companies want a predictable outcome for their homeowner, right? Because when they refer you, 
they're putting their name on the line too. And if you don't do the right thing, well, I guess they're going to have to step in because when you are a contractor in a program, you have two customers. You have the homeowner and you have the insurance company. And you don't get to make the rules. Can you give advice to a roofing business owner how to get referred by an insurance company without a middleman? Like if I want an insurance company to recommend me, is it all always on adjuster or uh, not adjuster, who sells policies? Agent. Is it, is it always on agent uh, level or can insurance actually recommend local business? So I can't speak to the insurance community. There's a lot of insurance companies. Some have agents, some don't. Um, how they promote and sell their policies, I, I can't speak to that. But do you see insurance companies recommending roofing companies at all? Sure, they do it every day, right? And, you know, I think they want to refer more. They want to refer more. But as a, as a contractor, if you're going to take on more business, be careful not to overcommit your true capabilities, well, right? That's good advice. And if you can perform, you know, a lot of guys don't like to do roof repairs. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, it's multiple trips to identify the product on the roof. We love repairs. Yeah, I personally love repairs as a contractor. You can actually make more, uh, way higher margin than you can on a replacement. But it, you know, you've got to conceptualize that in your business model, and you've got to understand you're going to make multiple trips, and it's not always going to be a perfect outcome. You're basically putting a Band-Aid on a roof, and then you got to stand behind that. And that's scary to a lot of guys. But it, my God, if you're going to call yourself a roofer, be a roofer. Right? I love it. I mean, it's, it's fair. It's absolutely fair. And I don't get it. I don't get why uh, companies don't hire at least one repair tech on, on their teams to do it every day. Well, you got to build it into your model. You know, I can tell you there's a lot of opportunity for guys who want to do repairs, right? Um, there's also a lot of opportunity guys who want to do replacements too. And, you know, I want to be careful not to overstate the roof and understate the importance of all the other trades. Because if you're going to call yourself a general contractor who primarily does roofs, then when there's an insurance claim, the, the homeowner and the insurance company want the home back to the pre-storm condition. So whether it's a roof repair or roof replacement, be capable of being able to do both and not so argumentative why your version of the story needs to be in a full replacement. Include in your thesis why it's so important for your business to do as good of a job on the other trades as you do on the roof. I've seen so many production managers of roofing companies and contractors that call themselves general contractors who can put on a brand new roof in three or four days. But it might take 30 or 40 days to do 30 feet of gutters. And if, you know, as, as a salesman, it was always my goal to do the roof, the siding and the gutters in two or three days and be done, yep. right? And it's so impressive when you do that, the business starts coming to you right? Nobody wants your, you at their house performing work for months, right? An insurance claim is a very inconvenient thing in your life. And if you at the kitchen table promise to take care of this customer, then do it, right? And quit putting on the back burner the stuff that you don't really want to do, like the $350 window or the 30 foot of gutters. Guys, that's what gets you other business is focusing on getting those trades done as fast, if not faster than the roof. But the roof's so easy, right? You get a work order, you email it to your supplier. They figure out all the logistics for you and put, put the material where you want it. And then you have subcontractors you hand that same piece of paper to and they magically do the roof. Other trades are a little more complicated where you have to, you know, maybe 
send out a repair gutter crew to do 30 feet, right? And maybe it's not a perfect match. Well, upsell the homeowner. Don't be scared to ask for more business. You're already there, right? If 300 foot replacement would better serve the homeowner, they give them an option to upgrade and explain to them why 30 feet may not be their best option. So present them a new one. But because in an insurance work, guys are, you know, it's pretty easy to sell a free roof, right? But to sell a homeowner an upgrade requires you asking them to pay for things they may not want to pay for. And you're actually doing the work now because it's easy to sell insurance claim, especially if you're waiving deductibles. You're not selling anything. Are you even a sales rep? Right. And, and you know, listen, I, I was a salesman, just like most of your audience listening probably is. And I can tell you, the guy who sits at the kitchen table communicates their capabilities to their homeowner and then follows through with that. That's the guy that wins. There is no second place when you're that guy. 100%. You know, my closing ratio, my first couple of years in the business, it was single digits. Well, when I was done selling, there were only single digits that I didn't win. And that's normally because I would choose not to do business with the homeowner because not every homeowner is going to be a good customer. When you sit down to sell a job, I tell a homeowner, I'm here, you're interviewing me to do the work, but I'm interviewing you too, because at the end of this work, I got to expect you're going to pay me because I don't collect any money until my job's done. And you're a hundred percent satisfied. You tell that to the homeowner? Absolutely. It makes me accountable. And you know, if guys would do that too, and listen, I want to get paid quick like anybody else. So I'm not going to let 30 foot of gutter drag out or a $350 window. Oh, let's delay the claim settlement by three months by hiring in a PA and finding some fancy out serviced, uh, exactimate estimating company that can help me get $1,200. Who cares? Right? Either position a new and better argument that's more friendly or just eat it. Right? And, and that's always been my position. And it's probably why I've been yeah, very I, successful. I have to interrupt you. I think it's a, uh, just eat it sounds like really bad business advice. Because if we start. It is if that's your only job to do. But if you got a $20,000 But if, to with, with that it, mentality, you can just eat something on every job. And I 100% I'm, 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 I agree with you. We have to. We don't have to fight every claim. 100%. Let me ask you a different question. Let's take insurance out of it. I'm the homeowner. Sure. You're the roofer. I got a $20,000 roof and a $350 window. But you, you and I both know you can't do this window for $350. Do you want my business or not? Of course. It's as simple as that. And so why on an insurance claim do we soldier up? No, right? I, I, I agree with it. And I'm actually, I'm a big, big believer in giveaways and doing work for free. I call it marketing jobs. Like it's marketing budget, essentially. It's not, but, but see, they, they, the tip is don't just eat it, use it as a marketing budget. Like for example, a lot of times I'll do the job and, you know, let's say I replace a couple of boards. Can I charge it on the retail and insurance case? Yes. Oftentimes I'll say, homeowners say, well, how much extra for that? I'm like, don't worry about it. Give me a good review, right? Marketing budget. So technically I could collect extra 150 bucks. Now um, I know he'll be happy not to pay extra. I know he's seen me do it. And whether it's $350 window, homeowner knows you're losing money in it. Now he respects you and appreciates you even more. But it's marketing budget. I did not just eat it. Yeah. I just, it's, 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 that's what I meant. I, I, I get it. You know, the words I use may not be sexy, right? Just eat it, right? Right? Absorb it into your cost marketing, advertising, referral, call it whatever you want. It just, it, but here, here's the thing. Most of my business that I've done in my career came from doing another job and doing a great job for that homeowner multiplied, exponentially multiplied the number of jobs I did in my career. So, and that's been true as a salesman and as a owner, you know, Let's not worry about the small stuff, right? Let's focus on doing a high quality job and as many of them as we can. 
And what's the difference at the end of the day between making 30% on the job or 29%? To me, I'll take 29 all day if I go sell two of the neighbors by doing a good job for you. I agree. And so why create friction where it's not required or necessary? Right? If I called you and said, hey, Dimitri, all I have is a $350 window. You and I both know you can't do it for that. That's not a fair request from the homeowner. That's not a profitable way to do business. And I agree with you 100%. And I think that's what's missing um, in the roofing industry in general. We have small minds because our numbers may be too high. But if you go to a restaurant and you sit down and maybe you wait for the order like a little bit longer and then, you know, your waiter comes in and say, this is on the house, you know, extra, like something for free, right? We all appreciate it and we all experience it. But maybe in the restaurant, it's just a couple of dollars. You still like it, right? Like, you know, your order took too long and you, we all love free stuff. In the roofing though, we're like, oh no, it's $300. And it just sounds like a lot of money to a lot of guys. Like I, I'm actually the same mentality with you. Like I give away a lot of stuff, you know, like my contract, for example, says like up to first three sheets for it's free like i'm not even charging you for redecking unless i'm start going you know five ten sheets so first five is fine you know i don't have to make money yeah i agree with you i just uh, also look at numbers and I'm, I'm i'm watching out for those guys because you know that 97 percent failure rate one of the reasons that happens is because you know we don't count our money we we spend a little bit here a little bit there we don't charge a little bit here a little bit there and then we're 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 broke so i'm very careful what i say even guys that grow big businesses really fast are also broke exactly. right <laughs> true, true, true and so you know look look for me i i love the roofing industry love it and when i wake up and go to work every day it's not for a paycheck it's because it's what i love to do and if $300 is going to stand in the way of me and you doing business together, man, I, I, forget about the $300. I'll mow your grass for you if you need it, right? Wow. I want to win your business to grow mine, okay? And if I can build your job and put a smile on your face and you refer me to two or three people you know, or they, I don't even need that. Because they're all going to witness on your street what a great job looks like if I'm in charge of it. And so for that, I take a lot of pride in building your job. And that's on display in your neighborhood, right? I want to call attention to the job I'm building, not to the $300 that I might have given away. You built several um, hundred million plus companies. Uh, what's the perfect... Uh, size for the business for the roofing business obviously there's a lot of trends three four five million twenty fifty what's the easiest to manage and most profitable in your opinion don't outgrow your ability to service the customer you know, what, yeah. what what about stress for the owner what's the most stressful size any size <laughs> right i mean you know i remember designing some of these companies and you know, I don't think I've started a business that I didn't want to quit daily, right? It was, you know, it's, it's um, the roofing industry isn't designed for snowflakes. You got to be tough, right? The odds are stacked against you that you will not be successful. And there's going to be, the larger you get, the harder it gets, right? There's... Um, you know, I always like to say, as our target gets bigger, our bullseye must get smaller. Because the bigger you get, you know, there's some bullies in the industry that would love to take advantage of your weaknesses. And believe me, all of us have weaknesses. And if you don't go, to me, going to work every day was like going to war, going to battle, right? Being on the front lines is about survival of the fittest, right? And you're gonna get knocked down. It's like Rocky said, it's how you get back up or if you get back up, that matters.
And uh, I can't tell you how many times in my career I've been taken advantage of, beat on, been the target of somebody's ambitions. And you got to respond with toughness too, right? I, you know, have been attacked for a lot of things in my career, and I've learned silence is a real virtue. What's the most hate you ever received? The most hate I've ever received um, was probably at Aspen. You know, when I show up in a city with a hundred sales guys, even the storm chasers hated me, but all the local guys hated us, right? And so... How do you deal with that? Well, you don't and, focus on it. And, and how did they um, hate you? Like, so, ripping your signs off? Yeah, rip signs fights. off, you know, put bounties on jobs. Um, I've had... Um, bomb squads at my office for people throwing fake bombs through my windows. I've had all the uh, tires slashed in my parking lot of all the salesmen's tires. I've had um, death threats. Um, you have death threats? Oh, I've had dozens myself. Really? But I've had... Uh, like what kind? Calls? Messages? Like, we're gonna um, kill you? I've had written notes. I've had uh, text messages, phone calls. Uh, the ones I took seriously were threats against my wife and kids. Really? Yeah. Um, I drew the line with that. What, was it a competition? Was it yeah, it was other roofers. Other roofers? Yeah, you know, I, I remember down in Florida in 2004, the first job we built, um, one of our competitors across the street trying to build a job couldn't get material. And so they wanted to slow down our progress. So they're calling in OSHA on our job sites. And, it, you know, there's all sorts of tactics to try and hurt another guy. You just got to keep moving forward. You know, there's going to be haters. They're everywhere. You know, there's a reason why I'm not on social media. I don't have time to respond to all the people that want to accuse me of something. I, I don't have time to respond to that. I owe my team and my customers my full and undivided attention. And to hell with anybody who doesn't like it. You know, if there's something you don't like, I'm okay with you calling that out. But when you attack my family, prepare to defend your turf because I'm certainly going to defend mine. So, what did your wife think? Of, uh, like, what did your wife, how did your wife react to death threat? I mean, how come you didn't close the business like the next day? I mean, if I would receive a death threat about a family, I don't know what I would do, but. Yeah, it's, it's pretty tough to deal with. Um, you know, for me, it, I'm a big boy. I'm a roofer, right? You want to attack me? Fine. but. I will attack back, right? When it comes to my kids and my wife, I don't expect them to respond that way. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the only times that I've called in authorities to assist us in the investigation of and validate those threats. But yeah, I have, um, wow. you know, it's all good. Look, how do, how do you <clears throat> there's been people, you know, that have attacked from the inside. <clears throat> when you grow a business, when you're a salesman just on your own, you're out there doing this stuff for you. You're, you're moving towards your goals with your passion and what's driving you. And that is constantly under attack. If you can't handle it being attacked, then you probably shouldn't be headed towards that goal. Because anything worth pursuing should be worth fighting for. And I've never been one to respond in an aggressive way to where I need to tear other people down to build myself up. No, watch me. I'm going to build a future for my team, my family, and my customers. And, you know, I don't understand why other guys don't do it that way whether it's jealousy or just pure hatred or you know so and so told so and so and did you have people stealing from you constantly <laughs> yeah how do you deal with theft how, uh, what advice would you give someone brand new in a business uh, i tell people i actually just did a video about it my tips uh, to deal with theft 
how do you deal with the theft? So it depends on what type of theft you're talking about. Um, the materials stolen from job sites um, was just part of doing business. As far as I was concerned, we had to get very creative on, um, you know, things like delivering a job and let it sit there for two or three days. You know, I always believed, you know, having been a roof loader myself, delivering materials to contractors job sites, I can tell you it's a lot better outcome to put the material on the ground and let the roofers carry it up, even if you have to pay them more to do it. And uh, there's a lot of benefits to doing it that way, but you expose yourself to the neighbors, crews that drive by, that back up the trailer and take what it about, all. What about sales reps? Honey. Sales reps, um, you know, it, it, when they fill up their garage from their material left over on job sites, I don't really look at that as theft, even though it never made it to the supply house for a credit. Sure. The challenge and the problem I had with sales reps stealing was when they took a homeowner's check and had the homeowner endorse it and deposit it into their bank account. Mm -hmm. I filed charges on any and everybody who ever did that. Um, and how many people did do it to you? It happened in all my career. It, it's happened at least once in every storm I worked. Hmm. So if not dozens of times by one or two bad actors. What do you usually list to it? Is it pe people broke, drugs, just bad behavior? Like It's pretty simple. I mean, it's stupid. You know you're going to get caught. <laughs> well, let's focus on what the obvious is. Being successful means your life sucks, right? Being successful sucks, right? Why do you say it that? takes a lot of focus, energy, and patience to win. Sure. And along the way of success, right? And it's by whose definition of success am I talking about? I'm specifically talking about my journey, right? There are going to people, be people that try to take advantage of you every step of the way, internally and externally. And you got to be prepared to handle the mental challenge that's going to come with those distractions. What's worth pursuing? And what's not worth pursuing? So a guy stealing a check from a homeowner, that is not happening under my watch. A guy stealing a square of shingles from my job site, okay, just don't let me catch you because we'll, we'll handle that like men, right? Um, I don't need to call the authorities for that, but if you're going to outright steal from me, um, that's a problem. If you're going to threaten me, that's fine. I've been threatened my whole life. Don't threaten my family. Okay. And so you have to choose, Dimitri, what are you willing to let distract you versus what are you going to stay focused on? Have you ever had accountants or people in the office stealing from you? Unfortunately, yes. Um, I, I did have a bookkeeper steal about $50,000 from me. I've had a financial advisor steal kit money out of my kids' trust. Yeah, I've had real life experiences in the real world outside of roofing that people have tried to take advantage of me on. Um, you know, in both of those situations, we had a good outcome at the end of the day, but uh, you know, I just choose not to do business with them uh, in the future and they certainly don't get any referrals from me. Give advice to the homeowner who just have a hail dam damage on their property. Slow down. You don't have to sign with the first guy at the door. Find out who's educated with your job. Figure out who can do the full scope of repair. And don't sign with anybody unless you believe with 100% conviction that they're going to do everything they promised you. Don't take chances. Love it. Absolutely great advice. Um, give advice to someone who just wants to start a roofing business get ready <laughs> life's tough and roofing's tougher and there's going to be a lot of things about the roofing industry you don't like you may want to change yourself be patient learn that there's been many others before you right so whether we're talking about a, a marketing strategy 
uh, a compensation strategy with your teammates, um, how you handle warranties, right? There's going to be a lot of opportunity for you to recreate things inside your own four walls. Reach out to mentors, ask them what's worked, and understand a mentor doesn't tell you what you want to hear. They tell you what you need to hear. And, you know, there's been plenty of times in my career that my mentors told me things that I swore when they told me I would never do that, I would never uh, uh, respond this way or that way or try this or try that. But I can tell you, the guys I really respected, who I believe were being 100% honest with me, I tried those things even though I disagreed with them. And what's funny is, it's the long way around. Education's, you know, a time-consuming journey. And, you know, whether we're talking about education, learning from mentors, uh, you know, you, you've got to be patient in this game. There is no easy button. There is no fast way to success. You can't become more successful until you've built a foundation of education and successful outcomes. Then you can scale it. These guys that sell a business in a box that took some of my old paperwork, threw it in a box and sold it for 300 bucks and told the roofer, hey, if you buy my box, you'll be a successful roofing company owner. That's hogwash, right? Develop your own tools, your own paperwork, your own technologies and your own customers uh, base. And then develop your teammates to believe in the things you believe in and that's, you know, customer service, Dimitri. Yeah. It's something you do. It's not something you say. And so if you, if you teach your team to really understand that, we don't put anything in writing we don't stand behind. We don't omit things from being on a contract and verbally communicate that to a homeowner. If there's not a straight and narrow path for you to do business with a homeowner, don't do business with them. Homeowners will try to take advantage of you too, sure. right? Everyone is out to get you in some way, shape or form sometimes, right? You're gonna have bad days and you're gonna do a bad job and you're gonna tell yourself that you're right. It's hard to take a step back in the heat of the battle and admit your faults and your wrongs, but the guys who can do that they're going to be wildly successful. Great advice. Absolutely great advice. Well, I had a blast. Uh, my last question for you is, um, you sold the Mad Sky. What's next in store for you? What are you doing now? Are you retired? Are you open for ideas? What do you do? I'm only 44. I think I've got a few more ventures in me. You look like 30, 43 and a half. It's the haircut. <laughs> I, um, you know, I'd kind of like your audience to tell me, what would you like to see next for me? Awesome. Guys, comment below your business idea for LC. What do you, what do you see is trending right now in the roofing industry, construction industry, maybe in apps, high tech, doesn't matter. I want to hear from you, your ideas for this man. We need more guys like him who are honest, hardworking and know how to build, knows how to build a business and whether sell it or pass it to someone comment below uh, great idea and lc will pick the best comment and you'll have a chance to pitch him your idea and maybe he'll go 50 50 in you invest in you uh, i want to hear your ideas as well comment below if you have any questions can i get a commitment from you to answer some comments on the youtube i can't wait to answer the comments and i look forward to uh, potentially grabbing one of these concepts and making it a business Love it. Thank you so much for your time, Thank sir. Thank you, Dimitri.